I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation, and this is the second day of Print Month and the IFPDA Fine Art Print Fair online. When we realized the print fair and what used to be just print week would be online experiences, we brainstormed about how we might do something with Zoom that we couldn't do at the Javits Center, showing you the how and the where behind the products of these amazing artist collaborations and projects. In putting together our print month programming, several themes emerged, including diversity in the printmaking world and the pivotal role of women printmakers, artists, and entrepreneurs. We have programs over the next few weeks that explore the impact of the women who came out of Atelier 17, women artists of the WPA, indigenous and African-American artists, and a conversation and studio visit with the founder and artists of Black Women of Print. Today we have the rare treat of a behind the scenes tour of ULAE, Universal Limited Artist Editions, with Larissa Goldston, the director. This is the first of five live Zoom visits we'll be having as part of Print Month. These amazing Willy Wonka spaces are where the magic happens and the history of this place is part of the history of modern art. Um, I'm sure you know Zoom is an imperfect medium. Uh, I hope you can be patient with us when the Wi-Fi fades and the Zoom lags but we are really excited to get up and walk around and that's what we'll do after Larissa Goldston uh, tells us a little bit more about the kick-ass woman who started it all. And just a moment of housekeeping, um, we will have the, the Q&A is enabled now. If you have questions for Larissa as we move through the space, just type them in to the Q&A box and I will be asking them for you um, as time allows. And with that, I'm happy to introduce Larissa Goldston director of ULAE. Hi everyone, um, little untraditional here. You're not seeing me because um, we thought it would be nice to start this tour um, with a slideshow because a tour of ULAE isn't just a tour of our studios. Um, it's traditionally a retelling of our history so that you can understand what happened here and what continues to happen here. Usually we'd begin a tour at the location we call Skidmore Place. It's the house where Tanya, you can see it here, it's the house where Tanya and Maurice Grossman lived and started ULAE. It still houses the original transfer lith lithography press um, and most of our stones and it is extremely rich with history and stories. But although Zoom is fantastic, we can't be in two places at once. So I thought it would be nice to begin this tour with a slideshow. For those of you that don't know me and the story of ULAE, you should know that this history is also my history. I wanted to follow up on Jenny's comments about women in printmaking. It's always been important for me that people understand that I wouldn't be here without the strong women in the art world that preceded me. For years, in fact, since the, the Whitney hosted um, the American Century Exhibition, for those of you who remember it, they left out the most important detail to me, so it's been my mission in life to make people understand that although often under overlooked, three women, that's exactly right, three women changed the course of art history in America. Tanya Grossman was the first of the three. In 1955, at a time when women weren't even acceptable as viable artists within the art world, let alone business owners, Tanya started a business that would become recognized by the entire art world as the business that began the revival of printmaking in America. Then, June Wayne started Tamron Institute in 1960, followed by Kath Ann Brown, who started Crown Point Press in 1962. These were extremely complicated times for women, and these women pressed on. So with that, <laughs> I move on to the history of ULAE. Two years before I was born, <clears throat> my father started working at ULAE, commuting between the University of Minnesota, where he was doing his graduate work in printmaking, three days in New York, four days in Minnesota. Then, in the spring of 1971, my father moved us to Long Island, and at my christening that summer, Tanya was named as my godmother. When my father called her to tell her that he'd had a baby girl, she asked if they'd picked a name. When he told her they hadn't, she suggested Larissa. They loved it, but they had no idea of its meaning at the time. I spent much of my childhood at ULAE. It was the only way I got to see my father. While he worked in the studio, Tanya spent hours teaching my brother and I about opera, foreign language, art, anything that was significant. 
As children, we dreaded our time at ULAE, not realizing that we were spending time with some of the greatest minds and artists like Buckminster Fuller, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, James Rosenquist, Helen Frankenthaler. The list is endless. Tanya died when I was only 11, but she left such a lasting impression on my life. The details of Tanya's story and how ULA began are so serendipitous that at times they may seem unreal, but I assure you it's all very, very true. Tanya was born in Ekaterinburg, Russia in 1904. Her father was a typographer and had been sent by the government to Siberia to start a newspaper so they could keep track of the political situation. The family was Jewish, but due to political tensions, Tanya's mother converted to Christianity. Her father never crossed his beliefs, but her mother became a devout Christian. Her father was a very, very successful man. And by 1917, they lived in a house so grand that during the Russian Revolution, an entire wing was commandeered for political prisoners without disrupting the routine of the family. In 1918, the Tsar Nicholas II was assassinated in a house just down the block from Tanya's family. She used to tell the story about how her father brought home a copy of the newspaper announcing the Tsar's death, and then members of the military showing up at their home and taking her father away. When he returned in the morning, the newspapers no longer read that he had been assassinated. It wouldn't be for two weeks before it was announced to the public. Sensing the impending unrest, her father converted all of their money into jewels, which they sewed into their garments, and they fled to Japan. Tanya loved Japan but they were forced to flee again in 1920. And all the while, Tanya was suffering from a terrible bout of hepatitis. Her father worked tireless, tirelessly trying to secure visas to the US, but when they weren't able to get the visas, they went to Venice, theoretically en route to Switzerland. But those visas never came through either. So the family finally settled in Dresden, where Tanya's mother was from. Tanya hated Dresden. It was so dreary. She actually didn't speak for two years while, while she was there, burying herself in books instead. But then she attended the Academy of Applied Arts where she met her husband, Maurice. He was everything her mother despised and all that she embraced. He was Jewish, he was starving, he was a Bohemian artist. Tanya's mother threatened to disown her if she continued her relationship. So, as any daughter would, in 1931, Tanya and Maurice married and moved to Paris, and her mother, as she promised, disowned her. While in Paris, they shared studio space and associated with artists such as Jacques Lipschitz, Soutine, and Zadkine. In 1933, they had a daughter named Larissa. Unfortunately, Larissa died due to a double injection of a smallpox shot when she was only 13 months old. Maurice would say later of the tragedy that God took the child that they never could have crossed the Pyrenees with a child. In 1938, Tanya's father committed suicide in Berlin, which devastated her. Then, by late 1939, Paris began preparing for the war. Tanya discovered that the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society had been distributing money to the Jews that were hiding in Paris. She loved this idea and began to deliver the money to the people in hiding so they could obtain visas. She moved about the city as though she wasn't Jewish. Later, when she arrived in the US, she would be questioned by what was then the CIA in Philadelphia about how she moved through the city, the channels and the organizations that helped her. Years after, she was sent a letter stating that the information she had provided had been important for the soldiers that had parachuted into France and went underground and eventually led to the liberation of Paris. In 1940, two days before the Nazis marched into Paris, the Grossmans fled and spent three years in flight, climaxing with their walk over the Pyrenees. Tanya had only a fur coat and Maurice had only paints and an easel. They didn't carry any identifying papers except the paper granted by the Louvre showing permission for Maurice to be out copying a Velasquez painting. When they finally reached Barcelona, Tanya had lost several toenails due to frostbite and would suffer foot problems for the rest of her life but she said it was one of the greatest times in her life that she'd never felt so alive. They were treated like heroes. The story of their plight had made it around the art world in New York with, and with the help of Eleanor Roosevelt and others, their visas to America were granted. They reached Philadelphia in the June of 1943. They moved to New York City almost immediately where the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society gave them shelter, clothes, and food. Then, with help of their friends, they settled into a fifth floor walk-up where Maurice made a studio for himself and for teaching painting. 
the summer following, they were going to visit friends that had a home on Fire Island. They got off at the train station in Babylon and decided to walk and see if they could find a place to rent for the summers. A man in a limo pulled up and asked why they were walking on a dirt road on such a hard day. They told him their story, and he explained that he lived in the mansion on the main road, and if they didn't find something, to come back and let him know. They didn't find anything, and when they returned to him, he offered them his gardener's cottage, now known as Skidmore Place, for $15 a month. They eventually purchased the house in 1949, and after Marie suffered a heart attack in 1955, they moved out to the cottage full time as he could no longer climb five flights of stairs. Maurice then dedicated his time to making silkscreen reproductions of original paintings in Friends collections by artists such as Marc Chagall, Henri Matisse, and Grandma Moses. They started a business called Limited Art Editions. Tanya would take these reproductions to museum curators and friends and try to sell them. Everyone liked the quality, but most were not interested in the reproductions. They wanted original artwork. William Lieberman, then the curator of Prince asked her why she wanted to make reproductions when commercial firms did so much better and cheaper work. This got her thinking about what she could do that was original. Having a passion for Livre des Artistes the, and remembering the conversation she had with Larry Rivers, I forgot to mention that she'd met him on a ship when returning to Paris in 1950 and was completely charmed by him. She decided she would bring this idea to America. She convinced herself that she would publish limited edition books with artists and poets and then sell the rights to publishers like Abrams. Obviously, it didn't quite work out that way. Now, bear with me. This is where the story gets a little crazy. While cleaning up their yard, Tanya and Maurice discovered two stones nearly buried. They dug them up and a neighbor told them that they were Bavarian stones used to make lithographs, and that he just happened to have a lithographic press that he would gladly sell them. Tanya knew nothing about the lithographic process, so she went to Cooper Union and she asked for someone who knew how to work on stones. They suggested Robert Blackburn. He said he didn't want to go, but he claimed that she was so very persuasive and he needed the money, so he thought he'd work there for a few months but he ended up working there for four years. She knew she wanted to ask Larry to do the illustrations for the book, but she didn't know a poet. So she asked a friend at Grove Poetry Press for a recommendation and they suggested Frank O'Hara. When she finally brought her idea to Larry in Southampton, he laughed at her and offended, she asked why he would laugh at this idea. He called upstairs and he asked Frank to come down. They had been very close friends. They all thought it was divine providence and agreed to start a project immediately. This project became known as Stones, ULE's first official publication. However, before ULE published this book, it was well into the business of producing single prints. Since Frank wasn't able to work as much as Larry, Larry began, began to make images on other stones that had been sourced from abandoned factories. Douglas Howell, a friend of Tanya's, made handmade papers for her, and it was inconsistent. The printing wasn't consistent, the signatures weren't consistent, but friends and curators began to buy the small editions. From there, the domino effect began. Larry talked friends into helping Tanya and Maurice. So, Helen Frankenthaler came, she was married to Robert Motherwell. Larry also recommended Marisol and Grace Hardigan. Tanya wrote to Jasper for two years following his first show at Castelli Gallery, and when he finally came, he recommended Jim Dine and James Rosenquist and Ed Schlossberg. Ed Schlossberg brought Buckminster Fuller. <coughs> Tanya met Rauschenberg through Johns, and he brought Cy Twombly, and it kept going. In January of 1962, Art News was the first magazine to put a name to the print revival in America. The article compared the Stones portfolio to Picasso's Buffon and said that ULAE was the unrivaled leader of the print revival. Just seven years after acquiring her first lithographic press, 97 ULAE prints were chosen for the American Painters as New Lithographers exhibition at MoMA. The following year, Rauschenberg's accident made from a broken stone won the grand prize at the Biennale in Ljubljana. And then his shades became the pioneer of the multiple movement multiples movement in the 1960s. During this same period, Robert Blackburn brought a young printer named Zig Preedy in so that Robert could concentrate more on his own business. Zig was from Latvia and with his heavy Latvian accent and Tanya's heavy Russian accent, they got along swimmingly. 
Zig continued to push the studio forward, but in 1965, he was offered a position to teach at the University of Minnesota, which he gladly accepted. He continued to print for Tanya in the summers, and another printer named Don Stewart printed while he was away. Don had been trained as an etcher, so he encouraged Tanya to consider expanding the operation to include an etching studio. She applied for and received a grant from the National Council for the Arts to set up an etching studio. By 1967, Don Stewart had become ULAE's first major printer for Intaglio. Within that year, Larry Rivers, Jasper Johns, Lee Bontecu, Helen Frankenthaler, Barnett Newman, Marisol, James Rosenquist, Robert Motherwell, and Cy Twombly had all tried etching. Some of them loved it and some of them hated it. But Barnett Newman's monumental untitled etchings came out of this time in the studio, as did Lee Bontecu's fifth stone, sixth stone, and Robert Motherwell's most crowning achievement, a la Pintura. My father met Zig Preeti in 1966. He was working late nights developing something called photosensitive stones. Zig had been working with Bob Rauschenberg trying to develop the same process. So Zig called Tanya and told her that he found a student doing phenomenal things in lithography and he wanted to bring him to the studio that summer. Unfortunately, my father was drafted into the army. On his first day, he met a man coming out of the interview hall and the man said to him, whatever you do, don't tell them you can type. If you can type, you're going to be a clerk. And if you're a clerk, you're going to Vietnam. The first question the army representative asked my father was if he could type. He said, no, sir, I'm a two finger typer. So we asked him what he could do, and my father told him he could run a press. So we sent my father to the colonel's office. When he got there, they asked if he'd ever run a commercial press. He said no, but that he was a fast learner. He ended up printing all of the newsletters and invitations for the time he was in the army and learned how to run a commercial print studio. This would be invaluable information for when he finally came back to ULE. In the summer of 1969, my father finally arrived here. His first day, he set to work on a Jim Dine stone to bring it back to life. Then he worked with Helen Frankenthaler, James Rosenquist, and helped Bob Rauschenberg develop photosensitive stones. From then on, my father commuted back and forth until he finished his graduate degree and moved us all to New York. The business then began to expand rapidly. They rented additional studio spaces to add letter presses, an offset lithographic press, more etching presses, and photography equipment. In a short time, my father became the master printer and a confidant to Tanya. In 1976, when Maurice suffered a fatal heart attack, Tanya told my father that it was his turn to run the studio, that she would oversee the projects and maintain relationships with the artists, but without Maurice, it would only be a matter of time for her. In her final months, Tanya said, all these people at the studio are quite young. I heard that the cathedral will be built by the men, by the builders who know they will never see the masterwork, the finale of it. So I think about the work I'm doing here, it's the same thing, that it will go further and beyond me. Tanya died in July of 1982. My father assumed the business. She left it to him and three silent partners. When she died, many people told my father that ULE wouldn't survive without her. She had left him with nearly a million dollar debt, but he worked tirelessly to get out of debt and keep it going. He invited a new generations of artists to begin working, starting with Bill Jensen, who he'd known at the University of Minnesota. Then came Terry Winters, Carol Dunham, Elizabeth Murray, Susan Rothenberg, while also continuing to work with Rosenquist, Johns, and Rauschenberg. This carried the business through the 80s. By the 90s, another round of new artists came Kiki Smith, Julian Lethbridge, Jane Hammond, Suzanne McClellan. I began working at ULAE in the early 1990s and bought out one of the partners to become an owner as well. Together, my father and I have brought a number of new artists, some young, some mid-career, and some quite advanced in age. My favorite being the amazing Carmen Herrera, making her first print at the ripe old age of 102. Although we're known for our work with stone lithography, we do nearly every form of printmaking at ULAE. The printers are all experienced in every form of intaglio, silkscreen, digital printmaking, photogravure, anything you might be able to think of. You're gonna get a little picture of what some of that's like as we tour the studio. Jordan and I are now going to turn off our share screen and we're going to start the actual touring. I think Jenny can go ahead and open it up to any questions that you have as we move through the studio. I'm happy to answer 
anything else. Hey, Larissa, we have a, a question about the history from Margaret. She mm -hmm. is wondering if you think the places that Tanya lived, Russia, China, um, might have influenced the culture of ULAE or, or any of the, the projects that came out of it. Absolutely, 100%. Um, Tanya, part of the thing that Tanya loved the most about Japan were the papers and the fabrics that came out of there, the textures. So she would, um, that would influence her love of paper for the rest of her life. Um, you know, having been traveled and having been around the world, the finer things in life gave her the ability to consider how she wanted to present fine art to the world. Great, thank you. This is our other facility, Jordan can show you, we're expanded between 15,000 square feet that we have out here um, on Long Island, giving us the possibility to be in one home as opposed to the five different studios we used to have. This is where we all gather for lunch. Lunch is a huge tradition for those of you who don't know it. You can look on the website. There's a little piece about our legendary lunches. There's always been a chef or a cook that's been here. It was Maurice for years in the beginning. Um, and then now all of us <laughs> take a little bit of responsibility in doing that. But we all sit together every day for lunch for an hour between 1230 and 1.30, artist or no artist. COVID's made it a little bit more complicated, but um, we're hoping to get back to that, that at some point in time. We're gonna move into one of our processing studios. This studio is still set up. Um, often we host parties. We like parties at ULE. Um, and this one is still set up for from our 50th anniversary, I believe, um, where we printed a bunch of photos of the artists while they were working in the studio so everyone could enjoy seeing those. Tanya, who's our fearless leader, still looks over all of us as we're in the studio. This is mainly a production studio. The artists don't work in this studio. We use this facility. Um, it's a little messy, filled with archives as we're going through a lot of our archives um, at the moment. We have um, etching presses. We have letter press. We have two um, offset lithographic presses that are here. Right now, we're going to take a visit to Bruce Wenkel, who's probably been here now the longest of all the printers. Um, he's been here since the 70s. Oh, and the 70s. 80, 80, 80. Oh, right, okay, 80. Okay, so I was aging him. <laughs> this press has been here since the 70s. So this is um, an offset press from Germany, 1963. And uh, it's been at the company since, yeah, early 70s. And a lot of, a lot of Jasper Jones prints were made on this back in the day. This was the first um, offset press that my father purchased for the business when he came here. Um, Bruce is currently working on a Carol Dunham lithograph um, that we are doing plate lithography instead of stone lithography. This is part of a portfolio of five prints that we're going to begin exhibiting soon. And uh, this is a transfer press plate. It, um, Carol Dunham drew on transfer paper, it's an old fashioned thing, where he drew on it in the studio. And um, we put the, it's a kind of gelatin surface drawn with lithographic materials, and we put it right against the plate and run it through a press, and under the pressure and moisture, it transfers the image onto the plate. For those of you unfamiliar with what Bruce is doing right now, the main um, basis of lithography is that oil and water don't mix. So the image that's on the plate is an oil base and Bruce is putting water everywhere else so that the ink only sticks to the oil that's on the plate and not the rest of the plate. This is an offset press which traditionally means that the image will be offset onto this rubber blanket that's here 
and then reset down onto the piece of paper. This was mind blowing for Jasper Johns in 1971 that he, when he discovered that he would no longer have to reverse his drawings for his images. Magic of offset photography. Jenny, are there any questions at this point? Uh, we had a sort of a, a more general question from Andrew about um, just a general question about the artist and master printer collaboration and how it starts and who brings what to the table. Hmm. Well, uh, that's interesting. The for us, <clears throat> the idea is that the artists learn um how we work and we learn how they work so that they're able to get inside the brain of the artist and know what they need prior to the artist even knowing what they need and the experienced technicians which are the master printers here have a you know they've worked in so many collaborations over so many years that they have a general feeling even even upon meeting about how someone works and so even in the first day of working in the studio they observe how they work the materials that they need and then they learn how to bring those materials to the table even before the artist understands they need the materials and it's definitely different with every artist there's no like set way it really is a you know personality as different as every person is yeah you have to uh respond to different sorts of personalities and different ways of working. Some people really just want, have a clear idea of where they want to go and just want to get there. And other people, it's very exploratory and, and um, unsettled. And both ways are interesting to uh, contrast with one another. Yeah. The one thing that's different about ULE or that we understand is different about ULEE is that um, artists are not given a time constraint when they work um, here at the studio. In other words, um, we don't have a residency program where they come and stay for a period of time and make the print within that period of time. They come as many days as they want to come back and forth as many times as they want until they're able to finish the project. So. Um, um, they, so we have artists who work once a week for six months until they're finished their portion of it and then we move into production. And then we have artists like Eddie Martinez who's been in the studio who likes to work very, very quickly. And we found that mono printing works the best for him. He's able to draw and paint right onto the Lexan plate, which we'll see later, and see the immediate results as they print it. Some artists really thrive off of that and others thrive off of being able to make a mark waiting seeing how it prints thinking about what that means taking it back to their studio living with it seeing how it changes maybe something they're thinking about in their painting or their drawing and then bring it back to the studio and decide a different direction that it's going to go in okay we're going to leave bruce uh here with this and we're going to head over to the other studio as well we'll take a quick peek over at the larger scale, um, my, this is called the um, Dufa press. This is a larger scale press of what we were just looking at with Bruce working on it. And you have on here um, the last plate that we were working on of a Christopher Wool project that's being done as a benefit for the kitchen that we're just finishing. We're going to have a moment where we transfer buildings to our other buildings. So Jenny, this is where we might lose the Zoom link for a second. So if you want to take and gather a few questions, then we can rethink about them as soon as we get to the other building. Great. We did have one technical question about the, the offset. Um, there was yeah. a question about whether the photo process is how, how the photo process might be used with this type of offset lithography. Um, photo process? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah um, a lot of our plates are made um, from film that we print uh, out of a digital printer. And so, yeah, it's really, in fact, um, this Christopher Wool piece um, was something that he completely designed on, on a computer. And um, so it was, this is actually the first time that it exists in the real world. Uh, so these prints here that we just finished yesterday, yeah, this is all, um, yeah, photo plates made directly from computer files. And in these 
COVID times, it was easy to do a, a round of proofing back and forth. So we would send him a proof and um, he could respond to that and change the computer file and we could make another proof and mail another proof. So yeah, we do. Was that the answer that that um, viewer was looking for? I was unclear of what they were really asking. I think, I think that's a good answer. Okay. Okay, if it's not, we can clear it up. We can clear yeah. it up. Um, okay, we're going to go through a quick trip. To, this is where we do all the crating. And for everyone on, this is where the Wi-Fi gets a little laggy while we move between okay. spaces um, when she reconnects. Okay, we're back. There we go. Okay, we've got you back, Larissa. Okay, okay, so this is what we refer to often as our artist studio. It still is a production studio as well. We have another large Mylander press that's up in the front. We have multiple etching presses that are in this facility, and then we have an artist working space in the back. What we thought we'd do is we'd start with Andrea here, who is one of our newer printers that's been working with us. Um, and she is right now working on um, a Christopher Wool um, print that we're working on. She has a copper plate. This is an etching process. She has a copper plate that is sitting on, on what's called a plate warmer. It's heating up the plate so that the ink will melt easily into the lines of the etching and she's rolling the ink currently onto the copper plate. We thought it might be nice for you to be able to see how the process starts. And then we'll show you how the plate gets printed as well. So right now, Andrea, you wanna talk a little bit about what you're doing? Sure, so now that I have all the ink coated evenly on my plate, I'm going to use this tarlatan, which is a cloth that has been uh, stiffened with starch to start removing some of the excess ink and move it into my image area. Andrea, how long does this process usually take you when you're just trying to get through the toilet? I'm going to wait to see the image just start to break through, and then I'll switch to my next step. So that's about half a minute now. So it's just kind of like a walking thing. It might change the amount of time every time you take it. So right now, I'll switch over off the hot plate to wiping with paper and the palm of my hand. This is so that she can start to polish the plate, remove the ink away from the areas that are not etched. This is the longer part of wiping plates. <laughs> so, so this is a general idea. Part of why we like to do tours, and it, I wish you were all here in person, 
even though this works, is that you start to understand the laborious process that, that printmaking is. And we find that when people actually come and they tour the facility and they see how much work it takes to put together a print, that they start to appreciate the value of prints more. We're, we're probably a group of print geeks, but when you have people that are from outside places from museum groups that don't have the same familiarity with prints, a sort of light goes off in their brain and they start to understand that an artist spends a tremendous amount of time, as do the printers, making a print. It's not the sort of dumb stepsister or two you know, paintings or drawings. It's an instrumental part of most of these artists' careers. So we're going to do a little Martha Stewart thing here. It's like we have all the vegetables chopped and ready to go. Um, Brian Berry, who's um, the studio manager and master printer, is over here with the etching press with one of the second Christopher Wool plate that we're printing on the same sheet. And he's setting it up so that he can print the, the plate that you see on here. The image that you see on here is the plate that Andrea is inking right now. Well, They've so already... We had a question about what kind of paper that was that Andrea was working on. You mean what is the what is the paper that she's using to polish? Yes. That's an architectural drafting paper. Um, a lot of students will use like a, a phone book or something to clean the plate off, but this stuff works a little bit better than that for us. Um, and it's nice and soft. It doesn't damage the plate. And it allows her to take the ink off the surface without pushing into the aqua tin or the grooves in the plate and taking too much ink out. So right now I'm registering the plate. You can see that uh, one plate is already printed on this paper and it's been dried. And then we re-soak the paper. And we have, you, you're not gonna be able to see them, but there are tiny little razor cuts in the edge of the plate that we're lining up on the Mylar to get our registration right. I'm going to come on this side. The paper has already been registered in place, and then it's it's locked under the cylinder to hold it in place. So. Everyone's favorite part, the reveal. <laughs> So now we're going to put a sheet of paper on this board and we staple around the edges so as the paper dries it stretches tight and it holds flat. If we weren't to do that the paper would just dry all weighted. Yeah. And there you have the printing of a Christopher Wool. <laughs> so we're going to continue the, are there, are there questions? 
Well, there, there are many questions about um, how you select artists to work with, which projects you produce, how artists might come to you, how an emerging artist might have the great good fortune of working with a place like ULAE. Um, so that's a lot of questions, but they yes. all are generally the same answer. We're going to walk towards the back of the studio um, so that you can see where the artists actually work. So the tradition of ULAE is inviting young, um, young artists to work here very early in their career and part of what ULAE has helped establish them as legitimate artists within the art world. Not that they're not legitimate in the first place, but having this behind them helps catapult that belief that that they really have a given talent now there are hundreds upon hundreds of gifted artists that we haven't had here or don't have here and are sad that we can't have all of them here um, the the choosing of an artist is very very organic um, it traditionally happens through artists that we're currently working with who are close with another artist or they feel like they're teachers and they've seen some thing that is in their work that they think would translate easily. Sometimes it's just a gut response by my father or myself that says, I really need to work with this person. I, I've seen their work and I'd, I don't know how we're gonna do it, um, but we're gonna figure out a way to do it. I mean, when Kiki Smith, when my father had seen Kiki Smith's work in the, in the late 1980s and she was a sculptor, I mean, she had some experience doing her own prints by herself and, and such, but he just said, I, I, I have to figure out a way to work with this, with this person. And Kiki thought he was insane when he started sort of like harassing her a little bit going, who is this guy? Um, and then she finally gave it a chance and now she has turned into one of the most prolific and accomplished printmakers that, that is out there. Um, some people don't know that they want to make prints um, and it's our job to try to convince them of why they want to make prints. <laughs> um, and some of them are dying to make prints. Some of them come and they realize that this process isn't for them. Some of them come and realize that it's changed the course of their life. Um, and some of them are very, very prolific and others of them make one or two things. So to answer that question is very, very complicated other than to say it, it doesn't have rhyme or reason. There is no formula. Um, we don't take submissions just because we can't handle that much more paperwork in, in other words and being able to, to, to do it that way. Does that answer that question? It does. Now that, that answers a lot. I have two, two easier technical questions. Um, do you cut the edges of the paper after stapling and does stapling the print keep the paper from warping? So yes, stapling flattens the paper. Um, the other way that we do it is between blotters where we, we are able to, if the, if the artist doesn't want it cut with a razor, um, and then we tear, we generally tear sheets. It depends on how the artist wants the edge. So it also depends on the paper. We have a trove of antique papers that have deckle edges that we use. Some artists want to use those, some don't. Um, it just depends. More questions or studio? I don't hear Jenny. We lost yeah. you, Jenny. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. So, so this is the space where the artists generally work. Um, they have the whole space to themselves at a time and we're running back and forth between the two of them. We set up a few things that are in process right now so you could get a little sneak peek into things that other people haven't yet seen. Um, on the wall we have a Wyatt Khan print that is going to take us a lifetime to print. Um, it is 18 separate panels um, on one sheet and every single panel is a different form of printmaking. Um, we're still working through Wyatt's portion of what he's done is finished, <laughs> but us trying to figure out how we're actually going to print it on, on one full sheet is still in, in process. To the right, we have a Sarah Z um, project that's in process. This is a combination of digital lithography, collage, and silkscreen um, that we've got working, that we're working on right now. We had hoped to have it done, but we're still working on it. 
And then uh, we have a few of, Eddie Martinez has been out for the last few weeks. He's the first artist that's actually been back to the studio since COVID began. Um, and he's been working on these amazing mono prints. He's done 10 mono prints here where he draws um, and paints directly onto these um, Lexan plates. And then we soak a piece of paper, we put them through the etching press and they come out beautifully as these gorgeous, you know, they might as well be called paintings. They're mono prints, but they're essentially paintings on paper. Um, and then these, these are, are sheets that are not finished. Uh, Marina Adams is an artist that we've been working with for the last couple of years. And um, we developed a process very specifically for Marina um, as she works so organically and painterly and with color. We weren't quite sure. We'd, we'd started working on some lithographs, but then she saw this unbelievably gorgeous paper, this handmade paper that we'd been making here. We're not usually paper makers. It was just something we had done for um, an Ed Slashberg project. And she saw the paper and fell in love with the scale and the size of the paper. And she said, you know, is there a way for me to paint on these, on these sheets of paper? And we have this photo emulsion, which we can use, um, but it's a digital paper emulsion where she paints white on white. So the sheet of paper is originally white. Fantastic. You can see on the back. Um, and then she'll paint with white on it, not being able to see what it's going to look like. And then we'll take those sheets back from her. We print those sheets actually on a digital printer. And she picks a, P, uh, a, a Pantone color that we can print. And then she'll see the first layer of color. So this one right now has two layers of color. So the initial color, which laid down is the background color. Then she came in and she repainted the second stripe and so the background has two colors on it and the one stripe has the single yellow on it you can see it closer with the purple and the blue as well so the initial color laid down was blue then there was or a purple then there was a blue tone that was laid down on top of it now she'll take the sheets back and she'll start to paint another layer onto them until she finish feels like there's enough color layered onto those sheets of paper Larissa, we have a question from Nancy Burns, who wonders if it's possible for artists to work um, using two major print processes, um, like uh, lithography and intaglio in the same work. Oh yeah, so it, when we go into the other room, which we'll do, we, we're running short on time. We'll go into the other room in a minute. Um, you'll see the new Charlene von Hiles, and those are those combined relief, lithography, and etching all on one sheet. Perfect. Um, the last one we wanted to show, and this one's actually not in process, this one's finished, but since we had an overwhelming response um, to our social media post on this one, there were over 10,000 um, views of this. This is a Kiki Smith piece um, that she had made that has this incredible um, paper. You want, yeah, you want me to pick this up? Yeah, so that you can see. Um, that is s s glued onto the sheet on top of the, in, in shapes that she's picked on top of the original drawing. Um, the last studio image that you're going to see is um, this is the etching studio, just so you can see. It looks exactly like it is. It's filled with acid. It's a mess. <laughs> um, our aqua tan boxes, which look like they came out of the 1970s, and they probably did. Um, so all the etching magic happens in, in this space. We have other rooms dedicated to, you know, um, where we do the photo transfer for the plates. We develop plates. We have a dark room. We have a large digital room. But I think in lieu of time, we'll just go over and we'll check out a few prints um, that we were featuring at uh, the print fair this year that would have been on the walls. And you guys can ask questions as we show those as we show those pieces. Right. One of our, uh, one of our uh, viewers is wondering if you know what the name of that holographic paper is. Brian, what's the name of that um, paper? I'm not exactly sure. Um, 
it's it's usually used for for um, t-shirts and things like that mm -hmm. um, so it's just a holographic um, silk screen transfer paper we might have one little glitch moving into the other space going into now is um, our entire archive and storage space This is where people feel like they're kids in a candy shop. They want to just mm -hmm. stand. So this is where we house everything um, in a very old archaic system. As you can see, the handwriting on everything. <laughs> um, but we also have a small showing space here in the front, which is very intimate, where we can show any print um, to, to visitors who are coming. So I think if we focus on, um, first we were gonna focus on the new Carmen Herrera, um, which we published um, just a few weeks ago um, that we're now releasing. Um, Carmen is now 105. And I have to say, she's still working every single day. That woman is extraordinary. She gets up and she draws and she paints every single day of her life. Um, she's a great inspiration for me and reminds me a lot of, of Tanya. I think they would have been, I think they would have been friends had they known each other. So this is the new Carmen Herrera, Sublime. This is one of um, Eddie's mo new mono prints. Um, I wish you could see it in person, the texture. Um, it just absolutely looks like a painting on paper. Um, he loves this process, as I mentioned earlier. He loves being able to work fast. Um, he can paint these right onto the Lexan plates that you saw in the other room, and then they are printed immediately. So he sees the results. He's, he doesn't like to wait for results. And then these are the three new um, Charlene von Heil prints. She'll do a far away and then a close up of each one. And again, I wish you could see them close up because the, the combination of the relief, the lithography and the etching make it nearly impossible to understand how these are made. Charlene was a natural in the um, print studio. She'd worked obviously prior to being here. She worked at Crown Point, so she was familiar with how the print process worked. Um, but she became, she sent us a slew of drawings before she started working so we could get an idea of how she worked and what the visuals were like. So when she arrived, we had paper she could cut, um, plates that she could work on to sort of figure out how she wanted to use the aqua tint and make her marks. Um, so she definitely was the one who pushed us the most this year to try to find some creative ways to add multiple forms of printmaking to one sheet. We had a question about the Kiki Smith, um, if it had been or would be additioned. It is additioned, yes, it's additioned and done. Perfect. Um, we also had a question back at the beginning about the, the relationship um, between master printer uh, Robert Blackburn and, and ULAE. Um, what, 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 what's the what question? <laughs> meaning, sure, meaning what role he might have played. You, he, he, he popped up in the, the history. He, is the, he was the first printer. For ULAE. He was here for four years. Um, he definitely set the tone for the studio in the beginning. Tanya relied on him ceaselessly because she had no experience. Tanya was not a printmaker, never wanted to be a printmaker, didn't care about the process of printmaking. She just cared that artists made something beautiful. It was very important to her that you know, the papers were beautiful, that the marks were beautiful. In fact, she believed um, very strongly that if you weren't able to make a print in that day that you were there, that the magic of that moment would be lost. So um, she'd probably be quite disappointed in the months that it takes us to do things at this point. But um, she was very much in the moment uh, and beauty. And, and she was a very, very difficult boss. So she and Robert um, Blackburn went head to head a lot because he was a very accomplished printmaker at, of his own and had a studio and was training people and wanted to run that business as well. But 
he said that she was extremely persuasive and that he believed in her honesty and her desire to bring beauty to the world. And so he stayed as long as he could here. Perfect. Um, Nikki Otten has a question. She's wondering if ULAE has an archive at a museum or if you maintain your own in-house archive, which is, I suppose, what we're seeing. So, so in 1982, just before Tanya's death, um, she had negotiated with the Art Institute of Chicago that the archive up until 1982, can you still hear? Because the sound went up. Okay, that the archive um, went to the Art Institute of Chicago. So everything, they have an extraordinary online resource of um, ULA prints, all the working proofs, all the trial proofs, plates, anything involved with making prints that were saved from 1957 through 1982 is housed at the Art Institute of Chicago. We don't, they don't have the archive from 1982 to the present. We're still working on negotiations with different institutions about where that archive will go. Perfect. Perfect. Mark, well, I think that's it. We have four more minutes. Um, let's see, there are, there are still more questions about artists' residencies and applying for artists' residencies. We don't, we don't have a residency here um, to date. <laughs> you know, everything um, changes. Um, you know, we've, we've thought a lot about going between a nonprofit and being a for-profit business, and we have maintained our you know, corporate status. Um, but, you know, there are conversations and thoughts about the house and the original house that it was, even though we still use it for printing the stone lithography of, you know, changing it to a museum. Um, there's all sorts of conversations. We're still trying to determine how to move forward um, mm -hmm. with the history of what ULE is and how important that is to the future of what ULE is. Perfect. Well, I think that is a good place to wrap up. If there are no more questions, we're right on time. That was amazing. Um, I feel like we were there. It was fantastic. Um, thank you, Larissa. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and for your great questions. I hope to see you at uh, the program tomorrow and next week. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate your support.